separate the world into a STEM world, science and technology, and a humanities and history and things like that. Who here is a STEM person? Okay, who here is a humanities person? Okay, fair enough. Okay, this is fine, um, but uh, we will go. Okay, so I, who am I? I am um, a professor here in computer science. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is data, you know, uh, is analyzing large, large and interesting data sets. And I like working with social scientists, okay? Here you have a picture of me with a uh, professor who used to be here in sociology. Today we'll talk about uh, some projects that uh, I'm working on with a different professor who's currently in the sociology department, Jason Jones. Um, but I like looking at um, data analysis techniques for the social sciences. And, um, oh, and one other point. If this, this will go wildly better if there are questions and interaction during, during, during this. So if there's anything you want to talk about during our talk, please raise your hand. Let's talk about it. Okay. What I want to talk about here is a data source that is, um, you know, that, that Jason Jones and sociology kind of realized was kind of an exciting thing to play with. And uh, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, a lot of things in the world to understand people, people have identities. An identity as far as I'm concerned, again, I'm a computer scientist, not a social scientist. But it's about what is important, what do you see as important kind of to you about yourself, okay? And um, one kind of unique and new data source on um, measuring identity of how people think about themselves are social media biographies. Um, how many people here, I assume, every, how many people are on Instagram or Facebook? I assume you've got, you know, almost everybody. And how many people here are on Twitter? Relatively few, but some of you. But when you have a, go register on a social media system, I guess you can't see my pointer here, um, you, you often specify your, a 
short description of yourself. Here, Obama described himself as dad, husband, president, citizen. That tells you something about how Obama thinks about himself, or perhaps how he wants to present himself to other people. His family is important. His job is important. His country is important. And what's interesting is when, when you would join on Instagram, how many of you have an Instagram account where you have a specification of who you are like that? Does anybody? A few people will confess to that, okay? Now on Twitter, we're going to talk about Twitter in here. What made Twitter great is that these profiles are kind of public to the world, and so we can get them as data. But somehow with these biographies, you're in, encouraged to describe yourself in 160 characters, okay? And different celebrities or different people will describe themselves as, uh, you know, different things. You know, Kamala Harris talks or gives her pronouns. She talks about that she, her family relationships, okay? Um, you know, uh, Danny DeVito here is describing himself in terms of his jobs, okay? Um, here's uh, someone who's uh, an act actress who's describing herself in terms of being a... Uh, a mother and uh, her experiences with this. Different people have different identities at different times. And what makes the this data set of thinking about biographies interesting is this gives us a way to look at hundreds of millions of people and see how do they think about themselves. Okay, here are two people who are two of your favorite Stony Brook personalities, um, our president and our provost, okay? Um, the president says what? She's a president, she's an art historian, she's a photographer, and she listens, lists her pronouns, okay? So these are things, of, what do I learn about from this? Okay, she sees herself as an, as an artist, she's a photographer, that's something that might not be obvious from the resume. The pronouns are important to her. When I look at our provost, what is interesting about our provost, okay? I see that he's, I know he was a researcher on, a, you know, on addiction. I knew he had a hard to pronounce last name. Um, I know he likes to call himself Carl. I like people to call him that, at least, you know. But I found it interesting. He's a first generation college student. The fact that his parents did not go to college clearly is a part of his personal identity. That may be true for many, some of you. That may or may not be a big part of how you see yourself or not, but that's one thing you get by looking at this. So by looking at all different bios of people, you can get a sense of who do they think they are. So who do I think I am? Well, um, I didn't bother to write my bio. So uh, you have the option of not writing your bio. And so a lot of people don't specify much about themselves, okay? But a lot of people do. and so. What am I going to talk about in this, in this talk, okay, to the extent that people want to hear it? I'm going to start talking about this idea of how do you measure um, self-identity, who people are, think they are or want to present themselves as what they are, okay, by analyzing a big data set. Um, I'm going to try to talk probably briefly now uh, about uh, a big study that we a bigger study that we've done on this. How do people think about jobs and what they present in their identity? And I'm going to kind of conclude with some examples of uh, you know kind of some more recent analysis we've done where we break these pools into um, pools by where people are you know are from and give interesting insights in, from that. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, good. So how would psychologists, sociologists, social scientists study identity, okay? One reasonable technique that people have used is they would do surveys. They will ask a bunch of people, they'll pass out a survey in a, in a big introductory class, write 20 statements about who you are, okay? And you can imagine, you know, what's important to you about, about you, okay? Uh, and you know, from look, historically, by, by looking at this, this is the kind of data that people use, and psychologists have traditionally built or worked from to study identity. Now, what's 
bad about that. I mean, what's good about it is you can collect it, you can read it, people have done things with it. What's bad about that kind of data is that, um, you know, there's a limit to how many surveys you can give out. If you're giving them out, you know, you, you, you can give them out to tens of people, hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, but you can't give them out to millions of people. Um, you can't, um, what you call it, measure people over time very easily. One of the interesting things about identity is it changes. How you feel about what's important about yourself now is, I can make a good prediction, not what you're going to feel is important about you 10 years from now. Okay? How do identities change over time? You can't do that very easily with surveys because, first of all, you, you, know, you have to find the same people and ask them over and over again. But Twitter, if you look at the Twitter thing, we can get millions of, of point, data points uh, per day on millions of people. How do they, have they, has their reported identity changed today? And that's what makes kind of this data set exciting. Okay, any questions about that? Now, what kind of changes would you expect to see? Now, we have, you know, you might expect some things are simple updates. If you list your, by, your age and your role, here he was a student at 25, maybe by 26 they're no longer a student and they're a job and they change things like that. So you can start to see age progressions. You can start to see career progressions captured in this kind of data, okay? You can see other kinds of progressions, okay? One thing that, that Jason found, my, my collaborator, Jason Jones, that was very interesting was looking at what fraction of biography strings on Twitter described Jesus versus Trump, okay, over time. You know, Jesus is, has been relatively steady, although decreasing over time, something like, to read the account here, it was something like, let's say, 70, 60 or so accounts out of every 10,000 accounts mentioned Jesus as part of their description, okay? Now, Trump, starting from when we, he started collecting data here in 2015, shot up by the time of the election. The last election, he was arguably bigger than Jesus as far as identity goes, okay? This is a surprise. Politics is part of people's identity. If you have to describe yourself in 160 characters, do you describe your political identity, your social identity? Do you do, different people will have different ways of thinking about themselves and they reflect it in these bios, okay? So what is it that we have done, okay? We have collected Twitter biographies for now over, well over 10 years. Um, some of that was collected directly for this project. Jason had the foresight to collect uh, all the tweets starting around 2015. Some of this is archaeology in older data, finding older data sets of tweets. One thing that was interesting is that when you, when you got a, twi a tweet using the standard um, interface or way of collecting data from Twitter, it gave you every tweet or 1% of all tweets. And for every person, who, every tweet, it also gave you the biography of that person, okay? Among some other data, how many followers did they have, stuff like this. Now, researchers for a long time were very interested in analyzing the context of tweets and saying, what do your tweets say about you? Jason had the insight that what does your biography say about you is also interesting, and suddenly you have this. So we have like 1% of all the, the bios associated with 1% of all the tweets, okay, for many years. Um, I say provide ed, unfortunately with recent changes of Twitter, this service has been turned off. So if we, our data is not being collected now in the same way and volume as before, which is sad but we still have enough to say interesting things about the past. So we would get see roughly, people's biography, roughly one out of every hundred times they tweeted, okay? 
And so if you're someone who tweeted a lot, every few minutes you emitted another tweet. We saw your biography more often than someone who didn't tweet very much. We have to think about how we interpret that. When we analyze the data, the average person changes their self-description about once every 150 days. Okay, so you do see changes on a, you know, on a you know, reasonable basis. It's not, you know, people's identity is not changed, captured every day, but twice a year or so they feel a need to update their biography. Um, and in our data set we've seen tens of, depending upon what we call our data set, we may have seen tens or hundreds, and, uh, hundreds of millions of distinct people, and we've seen hundreds of millions of biography changes. Okay, so we get a view of how people think about themselves that is pretty substantial. Any questions about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever come across bots while you were doing this? Research? Okay. Did we come across bots? So the question of well, are there bots in here? So now, what is, first of all, what is a bot, okay? I think of a bot as being a mechanical Twitter account, okay? That's, that's there, you know, either sometimes to, to you know, to provide information, like, like what the temperature is every day, or it could be to provide misinformation or something like that. So the short answer is there are bots in here, okay? How many bots there are is a question, is a, what fraction of things are bots is a, can be thought of as a, a uh, question, you know, when different people come in with different answers. Um, you know, when I play with this data, I will, and recognize that if you are a company like Twitter, you're trying to find bots and take them off. So there are a lot of these accounts that will have disappeared because Twitter killed them. Those are presumably mostly bots. Bottom line is, when we look at the data, the bots I will say are a fraction of the, of the accounts we're looking at. I am not personally concerned that they, that they represent the signal that we're seeing here. If you think about it, it's hard to design, bot, it's hard to design biography strings that change over time in meaningful ways on a big scale, automated scale, okay? And so the answer is yes, there's bots. I'm not particularly worried about them in the context of analyzing this data. It's a fair question, but it doesn't bother me. Okay, yes? What about people who lie on their biographies? What about people that lie on their biographies? Is that good or bad? Okay, is that it? I will claim it's interesting, okay? That if you're walking around saying things that are, that are you know, if people's identity um, was such that they felt the need to lie to tell the world about them. That'd be an interesting ex dimension of human existence. It would be a wonderful question to ask what fraction of people lie or puff up their external bios, okay? And potentially with a data set like that, you can answer questions like that, this. What I like about this data set is, is a large number of questions. This is capturing how people feel they want to represent themselves to the public. Part of that is true, part of that is aspirational, okay? And you can study different th different aspects of this in different ways, okay? Yeah? So, uh, when you consider Twitter as the sole source, you, also, you only consider part of a person's personality, right? Because people don't want to go on Twitter, like most of the learned people, they don't want to interact with that kind of bias. There is a bias associated with Twitter. Okay, so now you're saying, I think what you're saying is, this is going to tell me about how Twitter users think about themselves. Yeah. Not everyone in the world is a Twitter user, yes. okay? This is because it's going to miss parts of the human experience because of that. And the answer is yes, but, okay, something like 26% of the people in the country have Twitter accounts. That's a number that stands out for me. Is that everybody? No. Is that a majority? No. Is it a meaningful group of people? The answer is yes. So you can, you can think to yourself how well this extrapolates out as a realistic subject of the full population. But even if that bothers you, the Twitter population is an interesting group of people. Okay? So I think that looking at what they, what they tell about themselves is interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay? And it, yes. Uh, you said one of the lines while presenting that uh, I have to be louder. You have to be louder. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that nowadays, like, the data on Twitter is not as accessible as it used to be back in the days. Yeah. And it is a sad thing. But I don't understand why is that sad when the data is not Okay. Reached. Why is it sad if Twitter data is not available? Okay? So, okay, again, depends on, you know, the world depends upon your perspective, obviously. Now, my primary perspective is that um, that that I am a, a researcher. Oh, oh no, no, I'm a researcher in uh, in computer science, and this is a unique data source that is nowhere else in the world. So it is sad to me that this goes away. Now, you may say, well, what is this violating privacy of people? Now, remember, on Twitter, by definition, everything you post is supposed to be public. So, you know, so it, it, this is public information that is on here. It's different than your Instagram account. I don't have access to your private Instagram bios. I would like that, but, but that's, that's private data, okay? So, so I, think it's, I think it's generally, I would, I would proclaim it said that I uh, ha have this, okay? Any questions? Yeah. Professor, apart from public data information or data set, what we get from Twitter or something other, so what is another interesting thing about Twitter? What, I guess, what data? Well, the fact that the data is available is an amazing thing. The fact that you get other properties of people by knowing something about how many followers they are, you get some sense of how <laughs> prominent they are in some world, okay? Do people with more impressive identities get more followers? That seems like a question you can now answer, ask. And so there's a lot of metadata on that that is interesting, okay? Any questions? Steve. Okay, yes. Can you share more technical data around the data sets? Like what's the size of the data? What's, what's the truth? size of the data? Okay, so again, depending upon what sample, I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but the way I like to think about it is, we have tens to hundreds of millions of people. We have presumably billions of sample points of their biographies. Every time a tweet went off from them that we collected. And we have hundreds of millions of transitions of people's bios. We saw their bio before and it changed, okay? So we're dealing with large numbers of things. The more tech, I'll give you a little more technical detail in a minute. And I'm slightly concerned because I'm getting a message on my thing that uh, says reload site, which looks scary. Uh-oh. Um, I think I need help. Somebody at the big prop crisis here. Okay? Um, in the meantime, if we look over here, this shows kind of uh, one other technical dimension is how longer bios. Here are the x-axis. Okay, boom. The x-axis, sorry about that. That's all right. Was length. The y-axis is a fraction of bios with that. There are a lot of people, like about 25% of the people are like me and don't bother giving a bio string. There's another 20% who clearly on the right try to maximize the length of their bio. They try to squeeze everything that they can because they're only given a 160 character limit, okay? So people take that, clearly take that somewhat seriously. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the sampling. Um, I'm gonna say when we look at these Twitter bios, there are two different kind of statistical regimes to think about these things. And both of them can produce interesting results, but, but let's look at them and see to what extent they are different. So one would be if I count how often, how, what fraction of bios that I see every day, okay? have, um, you know, uh, mentioned something. That's what we call a uh, cross-sectional average, okay? This means that if somebody tweets a lot, I'm gonna count them more often, okay? If new people join Twitter, I am going to add them, okay? I'm gonna look at them, and, and you could imagine that biographers, suppose, let's say, when Elon Musk took over, let's say that suddenly people of the liberal persuasion 
said, I don't want any part of this. And people of the conservative persuasion said, yes, I want to be on Elon Musk's Twitter. Now the population would shift, and you would be seeing changes in biographies that would reflect shifting populations. That might be interesting at some times. Although, the other kind of sample that we're interested in is the longitudinal sample. What if we restrict our attention to people who we see over a, at least once a year over a five-year period? What if we keep track of just these people, so the same people are tweeting every year, okay? Maybe now when we see changes, they're going to be reflect changes in the way people see themselves rather than population level uh, differences. Do people see what the advantages and disadvantages of these two regimes are? One would capture the changing population on Twitter. One kind of looks at a smaller number of people who we see often, so we see how these people behave. We've got a big enough sample that we can do both kinds of analyses. Any questions about that? Okay. And uh, the longitudinal stuff is kind of interesting. Okay. How do we look at these things? Generally, we're going to take the biography and break it into words and count how often the words are, occur. So when we look at identity, identity is going to be an individual word, okay, as opposed to token. We, sometimes we use symbols and stuff like that. That's different. And we have prepared um, websites of um, what you call it, uh, where you can access these and play around with them. If you've already just aboard with the talk, go to jasonjones.ninja, okay? And look at the identity trend sites that we have, okay? And you can play around and look at different terms and see how often um, you know, they, they have changed over the years. Okay, that's giving you some insight into identity. Any questions about that? Okay, so that might be fun to play. But what kind of things can you learn when you analyze the identity on a larger scale? So suppose we take all the words and we identify some as having to do with sports. What words have to do with sports? Maybe the names of sports, baseball, football, soccer. Okay? Maybe the names of teams, Mets, Yankees, okay? Um, what terms have to do with um, art? Maybe music, painter, photography, things like this. We can start to look at different categories of things and ask whether the prevalent, how the prevalence of different categories have, have changed over time, okay? And it's kind of interesting. People used to list themselves as Yankee fans and Met fans more than they do now. Okay? That kind of sports team seemed to be a smaller part of people's identities with time. What's, what's a growing part of identities? Politics seems to be an area where it's growing. In the time we've been monitoring, it looks like politics has become a stronger part of how people think of themselves, okay? And you can modify it. Religion has been fairly stable, okay? But this is something, so this is some interesting way to monitor these kind of things. One thing we can look at is pronouns of usage, okay? Do people list their pronouns? He, him, she, these kind of things, okay? And at the you know for a law at the you know at the beginning of the period a very small fraction of people listed themselves starting around 2018 you start seeing that these pronouns um, became more prominent than they used to be okay this sort of became a popular thing for people to use when they're describing themselves and as you can see there was a there's a difference between uh, the, 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 the female terms of she and her, more, they seem to be far more, you know, relatively more prevalent than he and him. You can sort of monitor a phenomenon like this on a statistical level. Any questions?
Yes. How does the collection of these data help us? How does it help us? Okay, so now this questions of what help us means. Okay, and that, let's start to think about it. So if you are a social scientist, you want to understand how people and society are thinking and how it's changing. And so giving data on what how people are thinking of you know how people think about themselves and how that's how this is changing is the kind of thing that academics like to study. Okay, identity is an important question. People's identities kind of are changing and what's comprising part of their identity. This feels to me to be an important um, level thing to kind of understand if you want to understand how society is working. Doesn't mean I can make a buck from it. Okay, so if that's what the, 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 the standard of it is, uh, I, 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 you know, I may not fail. But these feel like important things for society to understand. How do societies similar, are, are, how are societies changing? How are they not changing? How do they compare in different cultures? Things like that. Feels like important things to know about. This defines a lot of the academic disciplines in the social sciences. So that, that's my answer. There. What other things can we do? Um, <coughs> We can, uh, what you call it, we can look at how long things become part, stay part of your identity, okay? So if we think about it, if you are um, listing yourself as a, uh, you know, certain tokens are family tokens. I list myself as a mother, as a brother, as a daughter, as a son, okay? That's part of your identity. It will persist over some period of time. Jobs are part of your identity. They will change over time. Students, being a student is part of your identity. Stony Brook is going to become a smaller part of your identity 10 years from now than it is now. Okay? How can we mon monitor the persistence of it? And by looking at how often terms that appear in biographies drop from their biography. We can learn to distinguish something about how often something became part of someone's identity. So what this plot is showing us is that a lot of people list in their biography, at least at certain points, things related to uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay, there was a time when it, people were crypto bros, is a word I used to hear, okay? And that, that, that being part of the crypto revolution and how money was going to change and stuff like that was enough, an important enough part of their identity that people would list it on their biographies. There are other financial terms like finance and economics okay, and budget. These are more traditional finance terms. When you look at these firms and you plot curves, you can see how quickly identities change. Things related to crypto and NFTs and stuff like that, these terms, people put them in their bios, don't tend to become as permanent parts of their identity as things are more related to mainstream economics, with sort of where there's a harder enter barrier to get into these fields. Okay, and so you can measure how quickly things change and don't change with people. Yes? Um. Do you have an idea of uh, when when tokens disappear, what they're being replaced with? We yes, we do. So we know we domains. know for every token we can compare someone's biography and by look at what the changes. We know what comes in and what comes out, and we you know we can have transition state like that. Part of my talk, which I may not get to because we're having questions, and this is good. This is good. Was talking about transitions in jobs. And you find that a lot of, for example, assistant professors become associate professors. Those are represent promotions. You don't see associate professors getting demoted to assistant professors and bragging about it on their uh, bios. So yes, we can track what these changes are. And are they changes that are going towards greater prestige or greater what? This is what it what becomes interesting. It provides a look at how people see themselves and how this changes over time. Okay? 
Any questions about that? Yeah. So would your research coincide with something that could be like a uh, YouTube algorithm, for example, where you can see a clear change based off what a person is viewing and stuff like that? Would that be a possible like connection you can make? Using Say this algorithm? again. Unfortunately, my hearing is not as good as it louder? Yeah, yeah, louder. Okay, so YouTube algorithm, right? It's kind of like a similar process where someone watches a video and then they watch a video, a video, a video, and then you have like a kind of like identity of this person, like... Right? Okay, so there's other ways to capture properties of people. Mm -hmm. And so, certainly in YouTube, it watches your thing, it learns about you with the goal of recommending future videos and showing what ads will be good to show you. So yes, they build these models. Now this is a different notion of identity. This is a question of what videos do I like to see? more than a question of how do I internally see myself, right? You could imagine a world where someone sees themselves as a religious upright figure and then on YouTube they're watching nothing but porn, okay? That would be bad, okay? But, they, but so, so, they, so it, that, those data sets show something, but it's a different thing than what I'm trying to capture here. The interesting thing about these biography strings is they're written by you. This is not the machine learning. God, this guy's pretty sick from all the videos that they're watching. It's that someone is describing themselves in a certain way, okay? And so that's what makes, you know, for our purposes, this data look different, okay, than, than, uh, than many other data sources. This is part self-expressed identity. Any questions? That said, um, what you call it. You can, um, in fact, ask yourself whether or not these biographies do serve as features that would tell you something about it. Okay? So, you know, we had a little project where we did do trying to use modern natural language processing, where we would analyze what biography you, you, you gave yourself and ask, could tell web, find other people who had similar biographies to you and ask whether you have similar properties to each other. So in this case, we took people who followed one of these um, eight celebrities, Obama, Modi, Musk, Gates, okay, Katy Perry, Rihanna, Christian Ronaldo, Ronaldo, Ronaldo and LeBron James. We had a world where we had 100,000 people who followed one, each one of these people. So a total of 800,000 people. And we could now say, if I gave you the biography of someone, two people, if I gave, could I figure out whether or not you likely follow the same person? Do the people who follow R R R R Rihanna, okay, have similar biographies, okay? Is there information encoded in that? The people who fo both follow LeBron James, is there information in their bios that reflect that? Now, they're unlikely to talk about LeBron James in their biography. But what could we kind of show? If we took, for everybody's bio, encoded it as a kind of point in space, so we could measure the distance, distance between bios, we could say, for every person, I'm going to find who's the closest other person in my data set. And then ask, do we follow the same person? <coughs> if there were eight celebrities, the odds that if, I, if, you, if you were my closest person in biography space, the odds that you should follow the same favorite one of these eight as I do is one in eight. Okay? Now, it turns out, that we can measure how overrepresented is it that the nearest neighbor in biography in space actually follows the same person. And in fact, it's substan quite substantial. You can tell, you know, I, instead of there being a one in eight chance of me, us following the same thing, it's more like two or three times that, depending upon who the celebrity. The biography tells enough about you to tell you something about who you're more likely to be following. 
than this. And that, that again shows the kind of the power of these biographies. Any questions about that? I don't think I want to talk too deeply about that. Okay? Any questions? Okay. I am now going to blitz through what was a more me uh, a, a quick study about how people's identities relate to work. Okay? Do you, again, you're students. Would you, when you were describing yourself, and you had 180 characters, would you describe yourself as a student? Would you describe yourself as a religious person or an athlete or whatever else it is? How often do people describe themselves by their work? We had a big study on this kind of thing. And because I don't have too much time, I, I'm probably just going to blitz through this to kind of highlight it. What we were able to do was take people's Twitter biographies, and if they me mentioned an occupation, we would now save these people and study them later. So what were the most popular um, occupations on Twitter? Well, students turned out to be the single most popular occupation. A lot of people describe themselves as founders or directors or owners or CEOs or presidents. Why do we have so many people describing themselves as owners and CEOs and presidents in their biography on Twitter? Okay, can anybody have a theory like this? They're lying. Is it? One is, you're saying is they're lying. That's one theory. That's a an uplifting view of the world, okay? What would be, yeah? Um, people tend to be more proud when they have a higher position. People tend to be showing off when they're president, right? Okay? That uh, if I take a look at your resumes, which I don't know, you're probably prouder to brag that you are the president of the dog walking club or some other minor thing than, um, than maybe something that might be a, a you know, a different big... So it's clear that things like founder and director and owner and stuff like that, these are aspirational titles. These are things people think sound really great, okay? Other titles, okay, some of them we don't see very much. Now some of them are people don't describe themselves as soil experts, okay? Maybe there's another word that we don't have quite the right biography for. It. But the kind of study here is how much do people talk about um, aspirational things to, you know, as part of their self-identity. Self, self That's kind of one thing that we were really kind of interested in. And um, we can look at break, different breakdowns by gender and race about how people see themselves. Um, now sometimes when, we, when you do this, you start seeing that there are some professions where um, Men are more likely to describe themselves as this. Men are more likely to describe themselves as baseball coaches and baseball players and software architects and golf professionals than are women. Women are more likely to describe themselves as doulas or kindergarten teachers or makeup artists. Now part of this is because of who, who actually has that job. And part of it is a question of how you see it yourself. Is this something that's part of your identity or not? One of the things that's difficult for us to do with a study like that is disentangle how many people, you know, how much of this is that certain jobs are more gender biased versus, you know, just by in terms of what fraction of men and women have the job versus how many of them absorb it as part of their identity. <coughs> But this is the kind of thing that we can hope to get at by doing a study of these kind of things. One thing we can look at is what about salary and status? Is it the case that people list their jobs if, are they more likely to list their jobs if they have um, earned a lot of money or if it's a high prestige thing? And the red line shows what the median income for the year in the population was. The blue histogram shows what were the median, what was the income distribution of people who reported identities on Twitter 
it's clear that people report jobs on Twitter as being higher paid jobs are far more likely to be part of your identity than, um, than, than poorer jobs. People are more likely to list themselves as a professor than as a, uh, you know, a barista or something like that, okay? But there are also statistical measures of prestige. There are jobs that are considered high prestige jobs that are relatively low paid. What's an example of a high prestige job that is relatively low paid? Okay, people tend to look up to ministers, okay? People tend to look up to professors. So we're not paid that much, let me assure you that, okay? Um, you know, so you can study, is it that people, the, the overrepresentation of jobs on Twitter is because people like to report jobs that are um, high prestige or, or they like to report jobs that are high salary. And basically we could show that people were more likely to re overrepresent high prestige jobs than high salary jobs. Prestige is something people have measured. measured. They have done surveys on jobs and say, how prestigious is it to be, uh, be a professor? How prestigious is it to be a clerk at a store? How prestigious is it to be a president of a company? And in general, um, the, the, the people are more, prestige seems to be the thing that people are driving. Um, there have been various questions. Can we track how people's um, identities change? And these things are kind of interesting in the job things, okay? A lot of people go from co-founders to founders. Why do people go from co-founders of a company to a founder? Somehow they succeeded in pushing their partner out of it, I guess, and uh, they can now claim all the credit, okay? Or uh, some people go from CEOs to founders. If they had a job and they were pushed out, maybe they were still founders of the company. Um, and anyway, we can look at all these trends. There's a lot we can look at. That's what it should be clear to you, that from looking at these big data sources, we can monitor how people see themselves here as in industry, in terms of their job, and how that changes. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, I am. Yeah. What was the most surprising thing in the data set? The most surprising thing to me was... Um, you know, to a certain extent, that prestige of a position was more important than salary, okay, in terms of how likely you are to, that, that there are ideas of what people think of as good jobs and bad jobs, that it is internalized in their identity, that is independent of things like money and salary and things like that. Okay, so that's one example. Okay, the last topic I want to talk about here maybe I think people might find interesting, is when we try to do analysis of different countries and regions, I told you we have <clears throat> hundreds of millions of, of biographies. We can, when you specify on Twitter your biography string, you can also specify where you are, what your location is. Some people put snotty things like the moon down as their location. Most people list, uh, don't put anything. But there's still something like 10 or 15 percent of the people who will tell you where they are from. And when you've got 10 or 15 percent of hundreds of millions of people, you've got a lot of people. So we can start to look at, for certain countries, how do they feel about things. We, you know, we were able to basically break down things where we have something like 32 countries where we have enough hundreds of thousands of people that we were able to locate that we felt we would get a good signal about it. And we can now ask how do people's identities differ in Russia than in the United States, in India than in, in France, things like this. These become perfectly valid things. And we've also been able to do it for different states. So what kind of things can you learn once you break people down by countries? 
Now, one challenge in analyzing tweets from people in different countries, one problem with Italians, I spent a year, the last year on sabbatical in, in Italy, one problem with Italians is that they speak Italian. They don't speak English, right? And so if I'm going to try to analyze their tweets, okay, they have to worry about language differences, okay? One way to look at things that kind of absorb, gets, sort of overcomes a lot of the language barrier, though, are emojis. You people I can tell grew up in an emoji world, okay? Some of you are perfectly happy to slap emojis on, on texts and on uh, and biographies. Emojis give symbols that are in some sense language independent, okay? And, we, and looking at how different countries use language emojis becomes a kind of an interesting question to study. Here we can see, if you look at different countries, here we have a plot, every point here represents a country. And the x-axis is the proportion of the biographies that use emojis, okay? In general, the countries that use the most emojis have the lowest, lower per capita income. Why might that be? I'm kind of imagining that these countries, in general, maybe there is, you know, less, expo you know, less comfort or exposure to using English quite often in the population. Maybe that's, the, and, you know, and so it becomes easier to use emojis or other things. Bottom line is we can study statistics, things like this, in a cross-cultural way using our cohorts. Okay? Any questions? So what about flags? I don't know if anybody here has ever used, has anybody here ever used a flag emoji? No, a couple people twitching. Now what, what flag emoji do people use in different countries? Okay? If we've done a good job of geolocating people, I would guess that the most common flag in every country, from people tweeted from people from Russia, what should be the most common flag from people from Russia who tweet? I would think Russian, okay? I would think in India it should be the Indian flag, all these kinds of things. Sure enough, for every country, this is showing the x-axis is showing our cohorts for every country. The dark blue represents what's the fraction of all flag emojis that represent that country's flag. And sure enough, in every country, the most commonly used emoji is from that flag. So we, our geolocation means something here. Okay, that's the first thing I want to show you. You can start to answer why is it that some countries India and Pakistan don't school around. They all seem to both have, basically, almost all the flags that they mention are those countries to a higher degree than the other, other nations. Which countries, there are different emojis for sports. Which is the most important sports emoji in every country? And if you follow the world, in most countries, Soccer is the most important sport. And sure enough, you start seeing that in all countries, that, that red thing at the bottom represents the biggest one, which is soccer. Which countries don't have soccer as its biggest emoji? The United States, Canada, India, and Pakistan. What is the biggest sport in India and Pakistan? Cricket. Cricket, okay. So again, it's clear that we're able to do something here. We're capturing something about these countries from which we have this breakdown. You can start to look at LBGQ, uh, you know, flag emojis. Different countries will use this with different prevalence, okay? Which countries use it a lot? Which countries don't in their bios? And here we have on the x-axis, is a measure of the freedom, degree of freedom in the country. It's measured by something called Freedom House. What is the percentage of biographies that use these flags as a function of how free the country is? It's clear that in the less free countries on the left, there is less usage of these flags than on the right. 
were able to capture certain properties of countries from these kinds of things. Okay? We can do similar breakdowns by, by, by states in the United States. Okay? So if you look over here on the left, you could look at how many, what fraction of biographies mention God among states in the United States. Okay? And you can plot the degree of over and under representation. The red states have God in their biography disproportionately often compared to the United States, to the United States as a whole. Dark red meant twice as often. Blue meant that they mentioned it a lot less. New York is a relatively godless state, is one thing you can see from this. And again, this captures certain trends and certain things about properties or how people see themselves in different parts of the country. Any questions about that? I think that's probably where I'm going to stop with this. Um, in general, what are we doing as researchers? Well, we now have this, what I think is amazing microscope to tell, or te call it a telescope, to look at identity on a big scale. And now this is where real collaborations with real social scientists start to become an important thing. Okay, and trying to look at how much of people's identities are based on brands. Okay, how, who here sees themselves as an Apple person? Yeah, some people see themselves, that's part of your, that's not just what you're, if I ask you, how, who here sees themselves as a pressed toothpaste person? No one sees themselves on the basis of their toothpaste. But people do somehow, certain brands people are associated with. How much is, you know, education part of people's identity? Are you, are you proud to list where you came from? Are you proud to list, hey, look at me, I got into a doctoral degree, okay? There are issues here about identity that feel like big things that we are looking for, you know, social scientists that we, we can collaborate on these kind of issues. And to, to conclude, and then I promise I'll be quiet, again, I, my, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Foremost is Jason Jones, a professor in the, soci, in the, in the sociology department, who uh, kind of pioneered this work. And I have a couple of my graduate students, um, uh, Dakota happens to be in the front row. Um, but with that, I'm going to end and say thank you very much, and I'll take any questions that you want to go. Any questions? Yeah. I'm wondering if you have made any attempts, or plan to make any attempts to analyze irony or tone or non-literal players. Okay. So, so that's a good question. So I'm now breaking everything down into individual tokens. Now, if you say, um, but but people do say, try to say funny things on Twitter. Okay, people do try to say things that are ironic that may even invert the meaning of the word that you're seeing. And this is a hard thing to computationally do accurately. Okay, so the answer is, are we, you know. Are we, are we doing it now? Certainly not, okay? What would scare us about doing it is that this is a recognizing irony and tone is, is a hard thing to do accurately in a large scale. Now, again, as language models get better, these things probably get easier and more, you know, are more reasonable to do. But this is one that if we tried to make these inferences the fear would be we would add more noise than we would correct. <coughs> okay, so that's, I guess, the short answer to that. Yeah? A more practical question I have is, whatever data that you have collected, have you, like, stored it in the raw form, or have you already, like, com like, com like divided it into Okay, so the question is, what's happened to our data? We have safely stored our original data, and so we can, when we have good ideas, go back and look at these things again. Um, that said, a lot of what is important here is that the Twitter data for 10 years is huge, huge, huge. You usually don't want to work on it. Much better is building computational artifacts that summarize this data so it can be easily viewed. I showed you about those websites on that Jason Jones links to. Those are working from summary data. And so actually the summary tables, carefully built, are actually very 
probably in many ways more useful resources than the original data that we have. Okay, yeah. Since the demographic of social media tends to be younger, is the underrepresentation of elderly people seen in the data? Okay, so the question is about in, is representation of people here, you know, first of all, are, are age cohorts equally represented? The answer is no. The claim is that younger people are more prevalent on social media. That's probably generally true. That means that's probably not completely true on Twitter compared to other platforms. Do I believe that on TikTok and, and, uh, and Instagram you guys are the more active generation? Yes. Less clear that's true on Twitter. This is one of the reasons, it, it turns out to be hard to infer people's age from their Twitter profile. Not, not impossible, but hard, okay? And so we haven't really broken down people by age. But when we do do these longitudinal studies, if we're looking at someone um, who has tweeted at least once a year, we have a bio at least once a year for five straight years, we do know that at the end of the period, they're five years older than they were at the beginning. So that does give us some reliable insight into certain age questions, but we don't have as complete demographic information here as one might like. Okay? Anything else? Okay. If not, then I, 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 I thank you, and good luck, and uh, I'll, I'll see you guys later. Okay.